It's always a good day when a package turns up in the mail from Runcam. And it's an excellent day when two packages turn up in the mail from Runcam. I've got two boxes today. What are these? Well, um, let's take a look. Uh, first of all, what have we got here? This is a, okay, Runcam Swift 2 Micro IR blocked camera, 2.1mm lens. Yeah, okay, yeah. Oh, the, the little Swift is a pretty schmick looking camera. It's very small, but it's still a proper CCD camera with 600 TV lines of resolution. It's actually nice. And now they've obviously added the OSD function that we've got on the regular Swift 2 and the was the Runcam Eagle Pro and whatever. So this little addition of being able to monitor your battery voltage through an OSD built into the camera is brilliant. It's a fantastic idea. Runcam, it's a really good idea from them and the, those cameras are really excellent. So yeah, okay, so they've just added the OSD to this. And I thought, that's good. You know, I mean, that's, that's nice. I mean, this is a nice small light camera and I have a project or two lined up for this, but mm, okay. No big deal. Yeah, I'll get around to reviewing it, I suppose. Then I looked at the other box, and well, my eyes or well, my ears picked up a bit, or I, my interest was piqued anyway. This one says that it's the Runcam transmitter TX200. It is a 25 or 200 milliwatt transmitter, 5.8 gig, 48 channels, uh, FPV. Ooh, now we're talking something interesting. Um, I know you've been able to get little systems from EA Sheen and things where you've got the camera and the transmitter all in one. And uh, yeah, I mean, they're pretty good, but mostly they use a crap out CMOS camera. They don't use a CCD camera. What Runcam have done here is they've married these two bits together, you know, and I mean, it even comes with the plug. So you just plug it in there. And then this bit um, obviously is for, which I don't know. <laughs> Looks like power. I guess that's power. How do you set up the OSD on? I'm gonna have to do a bit of work. I've just got this, just opened the box. So I'll have to do a bit of research, a bit of work, figure out, oh no, of course, this, this has the OSD on the camera. So this looks like it just plugs in, plugs into your five volt supply because the video transmitter itself is only rated, what does it say here? Find the right box. It's only rated from 3.5 to five volts. So it's one S really. So you're gonna have to run this through the BIC on your um, ESC or from your receiver supply if you're running anything more than one cell. Probably not such a big issue because it is micro stuff and you're only gonna be running some of them will run one cell, some will run two. And if you're running two, you'll have, probably have a BIC for your ESC. So a BIC from your ESC to drive your receiver. So this will be powered from your receiver. Brilliant. And the camera, of course, is similarly equipped. It will run from five volts to 36 volts. So they should run just fine. The only downside I can see on this is that this camera has voltage sense. It would have been nice if you could have whacked this video transmitter right across your entire LiPo and then automatically fed the LiPo voltage through to the camera so you didn't have to have an extra lead for the voltage sense. It would have been quite nice, but it's gilding on the lily, I suppose. Maybe they'll change that next time. So that's the whole concept. You've got the little micro camera with the onboard OSD, and you've got the little 25 or 200 milliwatt selectable 48 channel 5.8 gig FPV transmitter. Now the thing is, it has a sleeve dipole antenna, no circular polarization, probably not really going to matter for a micro. Lightweight and um, and convenience is more important probably than having a, a bulky cloverleaf antenna on this. So it's probably not a bad choice. I mean, it's a choice that's been used by a lot of other micro FPV things. Here's the baby hawk, see? Sleeve dipole video transmitter, but it's got a crap ass CMOS camera. You know, one of those cheapy, cheapy CMOS cameras. These are great to fly in the sun, but if the cloud, if you get a high sheet of cloud over the top, oh, the picture really kind of degrades quite badly. Doesn't happen with CCD. So woohoo, bonus, bonus. Now let's take a closer look at this video transmitter because it's a great thing, but there are a few areas it could be improved in. Right, the first area I'm not quite so chuffed with is the antenna connection. They've used a UFL, micro FL connector here for the antenna. And these aren't really designed for high duty applications. And I mean, this is, it can wiggle wiggle. These are really designed for when you're building something inside a case and you need to be able to assemble it by just pushing on a coaxial cable. They're a, really almost a one-time use. They're not designed to be plugged in and unplugged or subjected to excessive stress. You'll often find these connectors on in, in your transmitter and even on receivers but there's usually a big blob of hot snot or glue or something to stop them from turning stop them from actually doing this because when you do that often enough they get intermittent and they don't work properly so i really wish they had either chosen a different connector or just soldered that wire on there just soldered it on put a couple of solder pads and soldered it on it would have been much more reliable over time so we'll, but we'll see how it goes maybe you know it'll last uh, an acceptable length of time. I don't know. But honestly, Runcam, I would think, I would wish you would revise this as an option. It's not really the best one. I know that a lot of other video transmitters have gone away from using micro FL and they're using 
um, the other more robust connectors. But this, of course, is micro, so you don't want to get too heavy. And the other connectors are a bit heavier. Now, here we go. We've got the signal wires for the camera. And again, look, they're just solder through hole onto the board. Uh, this is one thing that happens here, talking from an engineer's point of view. When you solder stranded wires like this, the, the strands act like a wick. So when you put the solder on this side, the solder flows through and it flows up these wires internally a bit. And you end up with one part of the wire that's actually just like a solid because all the little solder strands are held together by molten solder, which is solidified. So you have a solid wire and then it becomes a multi-strand wire. So it's flexible and then it's not. And when you have a flexible bit and then it's not bit, massive strains build up there with normal just use and it breaks. And you get an intermittent connection because the wire will actually break where it can no longer flex. Work hardens and it breaks. So these could be intermittent over time. Um, and it's the same with the power wiring. This is the same thing, you just go straight through there and you're gonna get the same effect. The solder will wick up these wires and create a stress point up here. Now there are ways around that and there's a really simple way around it. Put some hot snot on there. <laughs> if you put some hot glue on there, that will and move the stress point away to where the wires are fully flexible. It will help mitigate that problem. So that's what I'm gonna do with this one. And I would recommend anyone who's gonna use this would do the same thing. Another way, which is kind of a better way from a manufacturing perspective, would have been to actually extend this board out here like this, so it was a square board, and then drill some holes so that the wires would come uh, through the side of the board, through the hole, and then round onto there. And then the holes act as a strain relief. Because these wires are supported by the holes, the actual crucially risky bit in here where the solder becomes, uh, well, when the solid wire becomes a flexible multi-strand wire is not a subjected to any bending motion because the board is effectively holding that wire in place. Same goes with the power wire. They could have done that the same there. But these are little things, little things that, um, you know, I'm a bit of a perfectionist. And remember, this is just a small lightweight microtransmitter, so it's not going to be $1,000 and you don't expect $1,000 worth of engineering on it. But there you go. It's things that they could change very easily and it would turn a really good product perhaps into a really great product. It's those little things that count sometimes. Right. Little button here for changing your setup, the little LEDs there for setting your, so you know what band and channel you're on, I suppose. I haven't read the instructions yet. Um, simple. How do you mount it? Well, it's got a hole. It's got, has it got two holes or one hole? I see a hole there. There's a hole there and no hole there. So you could mount it diagonally. In fact, would it mount on the back of the camera? Is it designed to fit on the back of the camera? Oh, look at that. Of course it is. I didn't even check that before. This will sit right on the back of that camera. Fan bloody tastic. Look at that. Oh, yeah. So this is a really nice little micro. Let me pull out of it so we can see it in, in scale. That's a really nice little micro camera setup. CCD micro camera, 200 milliwatts. Oh, I really like that. Let's see how much it weighs. Let's get the scales that don't show the blood and see how much it weighs. It's probably just, I would expect probably seven, six or seven grams maybe, but then I'm old and I can't estimate things very well. So let's turn on the scales. Are we in, we're in kilograms. Can we go to grams, Where's ounces, pounds, grams. Let's see if I'm right. How much does it weigh? Nine grams. See, I told you I was no good at this. Nine grams. That's still pretty light, isn't it? That's pretty damn good. Nine grams for a complete FPV system. woo -hoo. I like that. That's good. Right, so next video, I'm going to show you this in action on one of my little foam models I've built with a view to flying FPV around the house. I don't know if it's going to work or not, but I guess we'll find out. You could see... Uh, complete disaster at exactly the same time I see it. But in the meantime, if you've got some questions on this little unit, if you've got anything you want to say or whatever, just put them in the select or the area of this uh, video provided by YouTube, you know, the comment section, that's what I'm trying to say, and I'll do my best to answer them. It's, hey, it's just got heavier. Oh my goodness, what's happening? The Earth's gravity is increasing. It's now 10 grams. Oh, 10, way too heavy. God, 9 grams was great. 10 grams, throw it away. I'm kidding, of course. Anyway, as I say, if you've got comments, put them in the usual place. I'll do my best to answer them. In the meantime, I'm going to start installing this on one of my little scratchbook foam planes and let's see how well it really works. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.